Who knows? Uh, let's. All right, so let's get into this. Okay, so. <clears throat> Thank you very much, this, RNST, uh, for the Prime this Game. Is I appreciate completely it. This unexpected mini draft kingdom. We're only doing this uh, because Fnatic's draft was so bizarre and it makes no sense. So this was day three of the opening week. I, I can give you my thoughts there, right? My thoughts is I think if Varos and Caitlyn is out, prioritizing Ash over Gragas is really troll. I think that Gragas' first pick needs to be first picked every game here. Uh, the main question is, it's like, I think if you if enemy pick Zaya, I think if you have Gragas, Zeri, X, 2-3, uh, then the draft just looks better already, you know? Um, I think it's important, you know, it's like, I, I see some criticism going Ellis' way, and people are saying, oh, he doesn't take the players into account. Why should he if he's talking about a theoretical draft, right? The whole point of a draft is to be strictly theoretical, right? And the theory needs to, like, have relevance in practice. But when you are drafting, you're assuming that everyone plays perfect. Draft was so bizarre, and it makes no sense. So this was day now. One of the things don't really make a pick anything that I would say. That Kate I think another like another layer of it, right? Oh, is Ash types. Um, for like themes of like what she's trying to do, what they were right things that end up remaining doing disengage, right? Coupled with like multiple different votes, you, she has a position, right? Um, so what does Vitality or what does Fnatic end up doing? Well, they end up going Vi and yeah, Vi was also like I'm assuming he's gonna say the same, but picking Vi into Gragas Zaya showing is really atrocious. It's like really, really bad. It's really and they bad. Go Zeri. Okay, so immediately now make up your mind. Why? Because Vi already doesn't have targets. It's like, imagine Vi ults forward. Gragas throws ult on the enemy that wants to follow up. You're fucked. Vi is ulting uh, your AD. You ult Vi further into the team. Disaster. Zaya can ult your ult. Like, she has all of the decision making in the process of deciding if your ult's gonna have value or not. It's like, Vi is insanely bad here. Are you trying to hard engage and have a pick composition with your Ash and your Vi, or are you trying to scale? Because if you're trying to scale... I think that... I think that Ash Zeri, it's not like the worst thing ever. I don't think Ash Zeri is the worst thing ever. I think I've seen many games where it actually... is fine, you know? The Zeri pick makes sense. If because inherently, it's like... Ash is a standalone champ. And I don't think that Ash necessarily... It's like, Ash is definitely better with the likes of Varus and Kate. But I think that Ash and, and Zeri... It, it is a lane that can be fine. You know? If you're trying so, to have a pick... Like, for sure, Ash and Zeri should be winning early against Zyraka. In my opinion. Uh, they has able to lock other in draft stuff like that. It doesn't actually properly translate. The idea that you should draft an in like a, a non congruent champion in order to achieve something or balance out a draft, it doesn't make sense when it's so far off theme. You can draft something that is still in the theme of what you're trying to do. Okay, so an example of this, right, would be like um, Victor is obviously known for his ability to be very good at disengage, but he's also known to be able to poke because he has his long range laser. He's a very interesting and unique control mage, right? So he's able to fill into different types of archetypes. Now, if what they're trying to do is have a scaling AD carry that is also a. But League of Legends is a lot like paper, uh, rock, paper, scissors, right? It's like uh, tools. There are some champions that are really broken and that they kind of break the game. Um, I would say that um, like Ash Arrow is an ability that kind of breaks the game. I would say that uh, Gragas is definitely a champion that breaks the game. Uh, but generally speaking, it's like if you want to, it's like champions that are strong in Zaya are champions that are ranger because inherently, right? She is heavily benefited by the idea of uh, entering her sphere of influence. And the way League of Legends is balanced is that in most cases, champions that have lower range, they have more inherent value in close quarter combat. So they want to be delivered into, into that situation through use of Fog of War or through the enemy having a composition that needs to force on you. So with that context in mind, right? any champion in the game 
is stronger when they're getting engaged on. I just want to say that. There's almost no champion that is weaker when they're getting engaged on. Because inherently the enemy is running towards you. You can think of any abilities. Like if I'm playing Orn, I have a tool to engage on the enemy. But I can get better Orn ults, better Ws, better Qs if the enemy needs to engage into me. Right? Artillery mages, it's like if the enemy is trying to push forward and engage on me, I'm going to hit my abilities a lot easier. Right? It's like obviously if you are the shorter range composition and the enemy has a longer range, you're the one that needs to be heavily influenced to commit into their sphere of influence in order to break the pattern of getting poked. Right? So the moment the enemy is outranging you in a lot of cases, uh, either you're going to have enough pressure that you're going to be in fog of war, then, like if you have enough pressure that you can be in uh, fog of war first and the enemy needs to enter your sphere of influence, fog of war can break range and can make range bigger. Right? Like if you're in fog of war, this is a, an example. So imagine now, it's like imagine this mid laner here, this is Zerath, this is his range. And his ult range is much larger, but let's say this is his Q range, okay? So this is Zera's sphere of influence, right? A lot of champions are going to have a hard time posturing against him on mid because they're going to burn HP and get hit and poked. And let's say that uh, you, you don't have the tools to hard force on him. Ideally, the situation you want to create then with your champions, like let's say you have a Sejuani. Sejuani covers a lot of distance with, with Flash, Q, R. She covers a lot of distance, so she can... The, her sphere of influence is definitely, like, really large. Let's say this is Sejuani. The point I'm trying to say is, if you're trying to break up the compositions that um, the enemy is having, like, long-range champions, like Jason and so forth, the way you do it is you need to play in fog, right? It's like you don't want to push on the waves, because if you're in fog of war and the enemy doesn't know your position, your sphere of influence can become very large, right? If I don't know the position of enemy, let's say, Gragas, and he can come at me from these angles, these angles, these, a these angles, his sphere of influence is even larger than me, who is the Zerath, the poke champion with the long range. So you can break apart these compositions that are too heavily focused on poke by just utilizing the strength of Fog of War, because they need to then enter your sphere of influence in order to, of course, gain vision and to, to get... Um, uh, space, right? And that is like uh, the main thing. Uh, that is how you break apart, uh, and that's an, an an additional element to the game. Like if you have stronger side laners, right, and the enemy wants to group up and siege, the way you leverage the side is to be in fog and to leverage the sphere of influence that you have and break into the enemy's sphere of influence. The worst thing you can do is be five people on midwave and just get poked, right? But my point uh, that I initially said is that. Every champion in the game is benefited by being in the position of being the enemy has to engage onto you. And this is also true when you're face checking into space and you need to retake space, you're assuming that the enemy is engaging into you, right? Because they're entering your space, your sphere of influence, they're entering. Don't you usually assume you have mid prior and enter through river throw? Through? No, but it's like, Having mid prior, it's like, let's say I am Zeri, okay? I'm Zeri. And the enemy has mid prior. I'm catching the wave with Zeri, and then all my teammates are in this area. Right? All my teammates are in this area. And even though I see Zeri here, she can easily join the fight. So me having mid prior is not the main main point. It, it, it isn't the the main thing that is the most important, you know? It's like there is there is layers to the game, right? It's like when T1 are sieging and they're finding opportunities to group, it's because they found ways to push in the side waves and then the enemy is catching. It's like the reason we see Gordrinker Jace is because he can win side prior and then he can leverage that prior into mid and then he can find themselves self in positions to siege without... Uh, having his ankles broken in terms of the economy on side. And what happens is that there's vision around mid, and then they can't be pressured, and then they can be first in river, and they can use folk of war, and they throw their spells on whoever's mid. Right? The point is, it's like, 
Kaiser is another champion that was like that, right? When people played heavy engage comps with Kaiser, like Nautilus, Orn, Kaiser, what happened was Kaiser caught the wave, mid wave here. And then you can't dive the Kaiser. And in a lot of cases, you couldn't poke the Kaiser because she had lifesteal and she was fine. You can't dive her because, of course, the enemy team just rushed here. And if you dive her, you're going to die. And all of these engaged champions that are very good in close quarters are going to murder you. Didn't BDS this week lose when SK decided to counter hard engage with hard engage? I think that BDS lost their game because um, they misplayed their setups and they gave away uh, a lot more breathing room than they should have in the context of um, the conditions they had in the game. They kind of threw their lead in my opinion. And also they were playing a very heavy engage composition into Zaya once again. I think that they had this amazing tool that is Gragas because Gragas is, just breaks the game. But I think with the position they had, they should have been at an advantage. In that game, what they did so well was that Crowny was amazing in the fights on the Zaya. And also, I think that Irrelevant played amazingly well with, with Nar. It is not about countering hard engage for hard engage. Because what happened in that fight is that the enemy is going into the... Like, the enemy needed to enter the sphere of influence in order to breathe. So let's see, BDS versus SK. BDS versus SK, we we'll just press highlights because the fight that I want to find is is a very good example. So this one. What happens is that in this spot, BDS, even though they have the engage comp, so to speak, they are breaking into the sphere of influence of the enemy to gain information. So SK can choose when they pull the trigger, right? War trip before of elements trying to get on to the back. Right? They were coming from very different angles. Their timing was super, super good. And Javan was out of position because he was spotted on the world. So this was very well played, right? But initially, the whole idea here is that SK was first on the objective. And they created a circumstance where the enemy needed to face shake into them because the Drake was spawning. In a different circumstance, you know, the mistake comes from before, so I can't see it here, but the mistake comes from before because BDS were a lot stronger on side and they need to be able to leverage their side control in order to create an economically viable situation where they are on Drake first and the enemy has to enter into them. Then all of a sudden the nature of everything changes. The enemy, imagine Vi needs to face check, now needs to face check, and the combo is there and BDS are in position to just engage in the same angle, the nature of the composition changes. Because once again, I repeat the same words. SK need to break into BDS's sphere of influence. And in this example here, SK was first. Caught. BDS with a fog of war trip before yes, like this is this is this is horrible, right? Because SK have all of the information. They know the timing of everyone. They saw Javan on bottom side. So they can pull the trigger and they can collapse easily on Crowny here. They played very well here, SK. But they managed their waves good enough, better than as BDS did, in order to be in the position where they can go first. And it's hard to put a tangible gold value on how important positioning is and being first is. But every champion in the game is very happy when the enemy is entering into their sphere of influence. Because you get initiative. That is the main thing. You get initiative. And even though, like, let's say I'm Zerath and my range is this big, right? It doesn't matter if I don't see anything here. It doesn't matter. I need to walk forward. Of course, there's blue trinket. There's, there's, there's elements like this. But that's why setup is so important. Because it can change dramatically the purpose of a champion. And it's like... Uh, there was these drafts at the World Championship. Let me show you this. So, at the World Championship 2015, this is going to sound crazy, but at the this 2015 season World Championship, okay, there was, there was a team, AHQ, I believe, is the team. They used Darius in poke compositions. That might sound crazy, right? But think about it. Darius is the best poke champion, right? He doesn't poke, but if you have champions around Darius that poke and the enemy needs to break into their sphere of influence, 
and Darius is there like a meat grinder is very good, right? This is the situation that Darius thrives in, right? All of the juggernauts thrive in the situation. All of the juggernauts are designed with this idea in mind. You enter their sphere of influence, think about it, Mordekaiser, right? He can pull one guy, he, he takes, the, denies the enemy, engage, right? Um, Case Hunter. Case Hunter, people, he's, he's, he's a tank, but he's a juggernaut, in my opinion. If you need, if, 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 the, if the enemy has better range than you, and you see the enemy team has a Case Hunter, and you need to walk through him, that feels very damning. You always want to have a champ that can finish off enemies that are low of poke? Not, not necessarily. It's like, the, the war of resources doesn't need to end up in death. Because if you're poking the enemy team and they need to base, that is a theoretical death that yields no tangible gold. But the, the moment the enemy presses B, he is theoretically dead for 13 seconds. And someone being dead for 13 seconds, that opens up the mind of what you can and cannot do on the map. There's a lot of potential. Oh, the enemy, one person is dead for 13 seconds. That's what happens when he presses B. So you, 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 you shouldn't look at the, the, the war of resources in a way that they, they only, there's only success if there's death or kills. There's more to it in the game. The dopamine hits in the game are designed for us to feel this way and think this way because, wow, you have this lady says, wow, an ally has slain an enemy. And, um, then the follow-up is, you know, you get gold, it's flashing, you know, it's like you're, you're in a damn casino. You know, you're in a damn casino. Let's continue with this. Able to play with the poke and the pick or something like that, they could do something like Ezreal. Now, Ezreal typically yeah, still fair, would yeah. not want to be accompanied with the Ash and the Vi because that is not a champion pairing that you would normally find with one another. I agree that Ezreal in isolation into Gragas and Zaya can be fine, right? But... The, the issue then is you're, you're currently the state of Zyra Khan, they are just higher value champions than Ezreal, that they, that they cannot just out-muscle you, you know? And you're not going to be able to pick anything together with Ezreal in most cases that are that is going to be able to punish Zyra Khan. So that is like the, the problem. Ezreal is not bad against tanks. Ezreal has a, a good amount of DPS. But it would still be with... The main thing about Ezreal, though, is that you need to find a way to build. Uh, you just have to buy Cyrildos on third. ...in the realm of consistency of what Fnatic would be trying to achieve. So it doesn't make any sense when the, Z when the Zeri ends up getting picked. The R3, you already know that it's coming. It ends up being Rakan um, for Vitality. Okay, so you already knew that the Zaya Rakan was coming, and you opted into what you did anyway. So now you have a scalingless Zeri accompanied with two champions that are activating what the opponents R1 and R2s are basically dreaming of. This would be like queuing up for... I think that... Um... I, I, it, it's from, from this point, I don't think they can win draft anymore. As crazy as that might sound, I, I don't think they can win draft anymore. Another layer of this, right? It's like with Ash, I, um, the, the only question would be if you go Ash AD and you play like Ash Zyra, you know, it's like you keep Ash flex and let's say you pick like, let's say you pick Cassio. You pick Cassio, and then um, let's say you go Jarvan, okay? Let's say you go Ash, Cassio, Jarvan, and then the enemy picks like Rakan, and then you pick like Zyra, or some shit like this, you know? Zyra, yeah, Seraphine is probably better than Zyra. It's, it's practically the, 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 same, the, the same lady, you know? But Seraphine is just more modern For an MTG Arena game, or maybe a Hearthstone game, or a Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Masters game, game or a pokemon online game or something in literally getting to play against the deck that you hard counter it doesn't make any sense it's very it's even more so bizarre when league of legends drafting is a face-up complete information game the only way to deceive or hide any of your information is via flex picks um and that's why flex picks that's, a, that's a good way of putting uh, it uh, per, you know I think that's, fair, yeah. that's why grogus is very good that's why jarvin can be really good i played pokemon uh, the pokemon M like uh, tcg I, I thought it was kind of trash played a lot of hearthstone lots of hearthstone and i played some magic but the, the the magic decks that i played were very basic to play you know 
um, because Jarvin's able to be multi-flex. That's why Karma historically has been very good in draft. It's why Jace has some value in draft. It's why champions like that can be very why good. Why is OP. League of Legends drafting is face up. It's complete information. And the only way to kind of alter that is via flex picks. But even then, the flex pick is still known that it has the possibility to be a flex pick. On R4, Azir ends up getting picked. Now, this is still consistent. I don't like, obviously, the idea that Vitality go for Azir here. Um, it, it is blind, and you know that Humanoid likes to play control versus control. Um, but still, I, I didn't like it in that regard. However, it is... I... I like it contextually. Aurelion Soul is out. Uh, Victor Talia is out. Syndra is banned for some reason. I think that slamming Azir here is, is like good contextually. But I'm curious to hear what other ideas uh, LS has, because I feel like my my read on, on j mid right now is kind of stale. Still consistent. It is a champion that flourishes against getting engaged on. It is a champion that is anti-engage. It is a champion that can also be somewhat anti-pick in the sense that he can throw out his wall in the event that he's getting picked and he can, you know, potentially separate some of the opponents. So Vitality's draft is still really, really, really consistent. I was saying before the game that I wasn't going to launch any bets on the game because I thought that all the odds were so terrible. But by this stage of the draft, the draft is already so one-sided and you can tell that Fnatic have no idea what they're actually doing in the draft phase that it makes it glaringly obvious that the team doesn't even, they're, they're not even aware of what's happening. Now, most teams in the world don't actually properly draft. And I constantly say this, people always show up to my stream, they'll show up in YouTube comment sections, they'll show up on Reddit threads, et cetera, and they'll say, well, what team does draft good? What team does draft good? And a lot of people will just think that the team that wins ends up drafting good. The reality is, is that if you go to any region right now, LCK, LPL, LEC, LCS, whatever, Almost no teams are drafting in response to what the opponents are showing. This is why we arrive, or I arrive, at the conclusion that no team is actually drafting. Now, you can arrive... Mm. Obviously, the, 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 the term good is extremely subjective, and LS's version of good could be extremely high, and you're, like, extremely high up there, and I think that's fine, that's perfectly fine. I, I do think that the general idea of picking champions that are good into the enemy champs, that's something that is very prevalent, but maybe not at the level that LS uh, believes it can be, which I think is fair. I just don't want to put words in his mouth, you know? Arrive by having a winning draft, regardless of your ability to assess what is happening inside of the draft. Well, like, as, as an example, like... Uh, let me sh let me show you. Um, we had hello Ender. So, for example, this game. I think this was <laughs> uh, this was a very very nice draft. Caitlin Heimerdinger locked in thematically. You know what the Phillies wants to achieve with support is something that Caitlyn and Heimerding are going to be really, really good against. They start off with Gragas, they don't reveal their hand at all, and then they slam Caitlyn Heimerdinger, and they know that the enemy needs to pick, like, a blind pick champ, right? And uh, the follow-up is, you know, the enemy picks Chogat, and they just spit on the flex by picking two champions that are going to shit, shit on Chogat. They are now in a situation where, okay, we need to survive bot, and we're going to be stronger than the enemy at every point in the game but at the same time this is not like some extreme level of what ls is uh, describing so i can still you know see some degree of it you know i just think like caitlin heimerdinger i can't think of a better two three here than aphelios lisa but maybe there's something that i'm missing choga was good against aurelion i don't think choga is good against aurelion I think going even and having Pryo is not good enough against Aurelion. It's just not good enough. Uh, please, please. Uh, I think people should refrain from characterizing the person behind the video that I am consuming. It's like, first time chat, LS tends to make generalization for the sake of argument. I don't think, at least here, I don't think it's, I don't think it's true, but maybe I'm wrong. Who knows? Draft, um, and then making adjustments or, you know, doing certain champion picks in response. To I, I think just the, the, the bottom line is, uh, the bottom line is, um, I think, 
the term good is extremely subjective, but I think that teams actively put this in consideration, right? Like an example is, uh, let's say us at the World Championship 2022. So this World Championship, it's like this, this whole draft, I'm not, I'm working for Team Yamato right now, I'm chilling. So group stage, so our, our game against EDG, our game against EDG, our game against EDG, EDG Fnatic. So, what is the intention here, right? Oh, you want to open Yumi? The thing is, like, we were opening Yumi, guys, because uh, we were too afraid. We didn't have answers into in, in, into Lushanami. As simple as that. I don't need to go into it more. But here, the idea is that we are going to set up a draft. It's like, our idea is that we know the Sivir is coming, and we have very high prior on Azir, so we invited the Sivir, and Azir is really good into Sivir. So obviously this is this is a minor version of this. Like of course Poppy is kind of shit into Sivir, but we were very limited in what we were playing, you know. Kalista, it's like the idea of Poppy is just to, you know, Poppy was just like level three dive, you know. If you have prior, just dive, just go for it. Kalista is is pretty decent into Sivir too. It's so like here, the whole idea is that we're going to have early, early game uh, prio, and then uh, we will be able to fight back. Isn't how to perform Kalista in general into the team fight? Uh, not really. I think this is perfectly fine. Like obviously, the if you pick Kalista, it's not because wow, Kalista is really a strong team fighter here. That's like rarely what you're going for if you're picking Kalista what you're seeing, etc. However, with what's going on right now, Vitality are hard winning the draft because Fnatic is inconsistent. So now Fnatic, they completely blunder even harder. They end up going LeBlanc into the Azir and then they go Orn. So now let's make up your mind. Are you trying to scale and that's why you have Zeri and Orn, or are you trying to do some sort of early game shenanigans and have some sort of a weird pick comp and that's why you have LeBlanc? Why are we blind picking the Orn in top lane when already our bot lane is inconsistent? And the main issue here with Orn, it's like, I don't mind some Orn blind picks, but like you're going to suffer either way, right? Because there's 50 champions you can pick into Orn. But picking Orn into what the enemy is showing, it's like Orn is legit bad against four of the champs. Like the enemy is already very, like when the enemy team has mages, most of the time you don't want to play tank feels like shit to play tank because they'll be actually be able to itemize against you, you know? It's not that the enemy has like Leblanc and, and something in order to like you get value off of the tank, but the enemy has like Azir. Uh, Gragas is good into Orn. Zaya is good into Orn. She has a lot of counterplay, right? Rakan is good into Orn. He's very mobile, right? Doesn't care so much if uh, he Ws his W. Like he has very easy ways of making his engage non-committal, you know? How would you see Renekton instead of Orn? The, the issue is that you can't really save the draft, because it's like, the enemy has Gragas flex into fifth, you know? It's not easy to pick here at all. It's just that... With the one, two, three, and the enemy one, two, three, I don't know what you pick four, five to save and, it. And the Gragas is still a retained flex uh, to some degree with mid or jungle and top lane. And then why do you have a LeBlanc in this team composition with two champions that actually hate her existence inside of the game? Nothing makes any sense whatsoever with Fnatic's draft. In a situation like this one, they should realistically just be looking for champions that are going to either pick or add something to the poke. Now, a champion that would do that without inducing any sort of magic resistance or something while playing against Zaya's theme would be Corky. And I know that a lot of people don't want to see that Corky is one of the better champions for Honestly, what is going on, fair, but unfortunately, fair. Corky is the reality. Fair. I think this is this is decent. <laughs> it's like, I don't know how the lane phase is against Azir in the current state, but, but Corky is pretty decent. It's like, the, 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 it, Corky makes Zeri better, right? The Corky makes Zeri better. And it creates a situation where the enemy needs to break the sphere of influence of Corky. So that definitely works, yeah. It's just the issue with playing some of the other artillery mages, right? Is just that they don't have any ways of actually surviving. You know, Corky having Valkyrie. Corky having Valkyrie 
is the main reason he works against Azir. Because he doesn't get pressured by the whole R combo threat that Azir has as a mage. So if you're playing as a if you're playing mage into mage, like let's say you're playing Zerath into Azir. So like, okay, you can poke him, but to survive lane phase is super, super fucking difficult. Insanely difficult. You don't have that same level of pressure against a champ that um you know can play. It's like Victor. Victor is very strong in the isolated 1v1, but he needs to think about getting fucking shuffled in perma because he needs to actively break the sphere of influence, right? So is a pokish yeah, a pokish mage with an escape mobility is like the best, and that's only Corky. It's like there's no other champion. So so I like I like the Corky suggestion. Reality. Another champion that would still be consistent with what they're trying to do, but obviously you're never going to get it out of Humanoid, is going to be Akali. Because now Akali is going in with the Vi and with the Ash and trying to do something. But again, even Akali wouldn't make any sense because they're showing you... Yeah, the issue is it's like you're committing into a losing hand, right? It's like I understand picking Akali because it's more in line with, 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 with Vi and, and, and Zeri potentially, but uh, you're picking Akali into Rakan, Graga, Zaya... Azir, you know? Gragas, they're showing you Zaya, they're showing you Rakan, they're showing you Azir. Now, Akali is a vacuum answer to the Azir, ends up making sense. However, when you entertain the entire picture, the Akali still doesn't make sense. So you're left with a limited range of mid lane options. You need a champion that's able to do something against the four champions that Vitality end up having while still being able to synergize or pair somewhat well with the champions that Fnatic has already picked. Now, you could do some weird things like Karthus mid lane or whatnot. At least that way you're able to offer the R and you're able to play something in, in I think the issue here is kind of hard to play Kartus. It's like it comes back to the initial idea, right? If Kartus has a Valkyrie, then I think I would like it, but I think um, Gragas, Rakan, they, they just have a very non-committal way of pressuring you, which I think that, uh, you know, that uh, Kartus can't uh, look for. Can I really recommend Dyson as a vacuum master? Bro, did you play poker again? <laughs> mid or you could do something weird like costadin but then if you're doing costadin why do you have the champions that you have above but again it's in the same line of thought that you know what what is there to really do you could do like twisted fate but the problem is is that in the current dynamic of twisted fate versus azir twisted fate isn't going to be doing the type of things that he was once known to do even though twisted fate does have some value i think currently <laughs> in mid lane other types of champions that might be able to do this would be something like Yone, but again, you're running into Zaya. So you have a limited range of options. You could do something like Velkaz or Corky. I think that those are probably the two best champions. Yeah, Corky, um, I like. That would be able to do Corky, anything like. in a situation Respect like for the this. Corky call. Um, but you are really limited. Obviously, the LeBlanc, though, just makes literally no sense whatsoever. Um, another champion that maybe they could pick would be... It's like the idea of LB, right? Is that LB, once again, you get to poke... It's like, I understand why LB is picked here. I just think LB is a lot worse with Vi. It's like, I think LB together with Vi, and I don't like it. I don't think that Vi has enough pressure. What about Lissandra? It's horrible, man. It's so bad. If you want to know why, then study the, the, the whole conversation that we've had so far though just makes literally no sense whatsoever um another champion that maybe they could pick would be it's like lb the whole idea right is lb she has a dash doesn't get pressured by azir ult doesn't get pressured by the azir ult combo thank you very much lord spears for for it thank you it uh, doesn't get pressured by the azir combo and he she pokes right so the enemy needs to pressure you but i just don't like it together with vi i probably think lb is better than ari be Ari, um, there to follow up with the Vi and with the Ash, Ari not being banned away, you would be able to lane against the Azir, but again... It's like, the issue with LB is not the champ she's playing against. The issue with LB is the champ she's playing with. You are running into Gragas, you're running into Zaya, you're running into Rakan. And that's why I think that realistically, one of the only options that you have available to you mm. is probably Corky. Another yeah, champion that would this. maybe be available to them would be something like Vigar, but the thing is, is that when you have Vigar, oh, Vigar you is interesting. Merc treads, and when you incentivize the Merc treads, your Ash also ends up getting hit as a byproduct of this. Vigar is And then you really also have an Orn in top lane, um, who will end up getting hit by some of the itemizations that the opponents can end up having. So probably, even a champion Probably like you Vigar, just have to go like Vigar, Kisante, uh, 
porque que Santa la hace away. Who might end up being okay in a situation like this is not really okay, but that doesn't mean that you necessarily had to go Orin. You could easily go Vigar in a spot like this, and then you could change up your top laner, but I think that... Okay, so, so we have had one person ask, do you think Cassio is bad here? And then one person ask if... Um, if... Um, if Lissandra. It's like... Um, the thing is, to play both of these into Azir is, is very hard, right? That these are things that obviously are never crossing the mind of Fnatic whatsoever. I will just so, ignore chat guys. Said, you guys are being a bit... Fnatic draft makes no sense. Pretty much across the entire Useless. <laughs> um, it, it makes it very awkward, I'm struggling to but find you can a nicer word, clearly but... tell that, you know, that they're not really thinking about what they're doing. If they do something like Vigar and then Gangplank on B4, B5, it begs the question of why did they end up be wanting b 2 ing you know, Ash and Vi? Because the champion themes that end up beating these champions are nothing like what they draft in the early stages. Now, if Fnatic, for some reason, end up having something like this, uh, you know, in, in response... Uh, to what the opponents picked. Well, now you have a very different makeup. Um, so if you have Ziggs being retained as a flex into mid lane, you can okay. also have Ziggs, uh, Ziggs against Azir. The Jarvan is probably never going bot lane as support here, but he does retain the ability to go jungle and top lane. Very unlikely that Jarvan would obviously ever go mid because that's reserved right now for Ziggs. But you could get Ziggs AD carry. Ziggs would pair with Ash in terms of his ability to. Uh, it's not about you guys being coaches or not coaches. It's more about the fact that it's like we spend 20 minutes talking about something, uh, an idea. And it's like, it's like, let's say I make a 20 minute presentation on why water is good for you. And then it's like, well, what about Pepsi? Well, yeah, that's just poke inside of the laning phase. And then he's able to be left alone on an island. This is interesting. Allow Ash yeah. to basically go elsewhere or look for like the close range arrows on mid lane rooms, etc. And then in the later stages of the game, Ziggs and Jarvan have a lot of synergy and a lot of follow up. The archetype of these champions does somewhat better answer what exactly Vitality are doing, and maybe the Azir pick doesn't much. end up coming through because Ziggs would be flexed oh. into mid lane. In the event that Ziggs would be flexed into mid lane, it, then you. you would end up, you know, getting your pick of the litter on ADCs that would look a lot better. Maybe you'd do something like Ezreal. Now at this point, you've now pivoted back to like a poke and like not really that much of a pick converse, uh, team composition, in which case your Jarvan is probably going to do things like R and then EQ out, rather than doing EQ into R and trying to trap the opponent and then, you know, bombard them that way. But at least that pivot would be a lot more consistent with, like, trying to play against what Vitality are drafting than anything that Fnatic was doing. Um, but anyways, these types of thought processes aren't going to be getting entertained or thought about whatsoever by teams that are obviously playing. Um, so it, it doesn't make any sense. But if I just put that out there for people wondering like what types of you know themes and picks could you end up doing in a situation like that you could also do something unique like go seraphine here because seraphine being able to pair with ash the ash w into the seraphine e is just a root and then this allows you to have a lot more scaling seraphine is also a vacuum answer to the gragas in the sense that gragas hates playing against enchanters because no matter how he ends up building no build is actually suitable enough against most enchanter team compositions and seraphine scales a lot so it would primarily be seraphine ad carry with ash support but but you do retain the ability to have Seraphine end up going mid lane, and then you have Ash AD carry, and you can wait and see how the draft ends up developing. But again, this requires you to utilize flex picks and requires you to acknowledge what the opponents are actually drafting, and then respond to it accordingly based on the desires of what the opponent's team composition needs, not what you want to do. Um, but this type of drafting would require more thought processes. Now, obviously, if you have something like Seraphine Jarvan right here, You're again, smart. you still have a lot of synergy. And this is a much better opening B1, B3 against the very obvious face-up R1, R3 of what Vitality was drafting. But the way that Fnatic's drafting just makes no sense across the board because it's just inconsistent. Um, sorry about that, moving the Olaf. It's just really inconsistent, um, and it doesn't make any sense because... Not only are they unironically picking a champion into a self counter, they're also self countering themselves team comp wise, and their champions don't make any sense uh, with one another. Either you're either yeah, either you're making picks or you're scaling or you're doing nothing. These champions also all spike at different points when you line up a lot of their gold costs and whatnot, and they're going to have very different strengths and timing, whereas the champions on the side of uh, Vitality are going to have much more synergistic timings, and then obviously the R5 still doesn't exist. In a spot like this one, there's also still a lot of possibilities in top lane. Vitality ended up opting into Camille. I think that you could also end up going like Enchanters in top lane, and that would be just fine as well, because there's no way for this uh, these mm, champions to end up I think Enchanter is not good. 
you you are too AP heavy. I think I think Camille Camille has Camille is pretty strong here because it has counterplay into everything. Okay, Camille has counterplay into everything. You know, it's like LB Zeri. They hate fucking playing against Camille. You have decent matchup into Orn. You have Gragas Jungle. You can R the Vi R. You can E very easy to do Jash. Thing. Um, Karma's open. You could do probably something like Karma in top lane, and that would be fine, even though she doesn't deal damage. I don't think it would matter. You could do something like Roaming Janna top lane. You could even do something like Set would probably actually be okay as like a bodyguard, and I fucking hate Set, so you know that if I'm saying something like that, it would be all right. You could also do Mordekaiser in top lane, and even though you end up having triple magic damage top side, it's going to be impossible for a lot of these champions to end up getting magic resistance, with the exception of Vi. Zeri is never going to get magic resistance, neither is Ash, and if LeBlanc is buying magic resistance, in this game then you've effectively rendered her useless inside of this game because the whole purpose for her being picked mm, I don't disagree with this point about um, you can like if the enemy team has a Zeri right then it's like obviously the condition of the Zeri matters in the context of Zaya but I, I think that um, I think there's some nuanced cases where it's so fucking extreme the value of MR that it even becomes good to buy it on champions that don't want to buy it. And I think this would create such a case. Like if you go LB Banshees for a second, in the context of this, it's a lot of fucking value, right? to be able to follow up on picks and if she's going something like mercury treads or getting banshee's veil or end up going zanya super early just because of the presence of a mordekaiser then you've effectively rendered her useless and it doesn't matter that orn is able to itemize extremely effectively against you um so i just want to point that out there that even though it's a triple magic damage top side the reality is is that these champions cannot itemize magic resistance effectively without completely gutting their entire reason for being picked um, so these types of things I just want to talk about. You could also do stuff like Lilia top lane. Um, in a spot like this, you could do Kale. Kale would be really free in a spot like this and would effectively do the same thing. You could also do Orn in a spot. I think AD Kale is fine, yeah. Like Don't this, think Orn it's that great. Really you could also LB. do Darius, um, although I wouldn't really recommend Darius. Actually, no, never mind. You can't really do Darius in a spot like this one. Um, Ivern would be another possibility. I think Roaming John in top lane is just really, really, really good. Another thing to point out is that this team composition is extremely immobile. Um, and so I, I think that like champions like Camille with the ability to just push and shove, it, it is really good. Um, these types of things are, are, are all just, you know, things that should be considered. Um, there's a lot of other top laners that we could continue to like look at and again, you know There's just very limited options for what the opponents could do You could do top corky in a spot like this one and there wouldn't be much for the opponents to do You could do a very historic counter which is like, you know, kindred top lane And there would be nothing for Orin to do That's kindred historic is one of Orin's like really good lane counters Another champion that you could do in top lane that would be really effective would be that. Nasus Because of his oh, value Nasus against is dank. Vizary and Holy Ash. shit, Nasus is fucking strong here by the way <laughs> Nasus is really strong. <laughs> Nasus, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would um, believe Nasus. Nasus would basically, go completely untouched in this game, and it would be impossible to kill him in the later stages of the game. His wither would have a lot of value. Um, you know, I mean, Nasus being farmed up in a game like this would just be an utter disaster for the opponent. <laughs> Nasus, so there's so many options. On Nasus our is insanely strong here. <laughs> our five that could just be picked that completely render Fnatic's comp useless. And this is just really showing how they have absolutely no idea what they're drafting. They don't even know how to draft. They don't even probably know what day of the week it is. Probably don't even spell Fnatic. They actually probably spell it the way that the word Fnatic is actually spelled. So that is it for the uh, <laughs> mini draft kingdom of Fnatic's absolutely uh, useless draft skill. And uh, I hope that you enjoyed it because uh, I did not enjoy watching it. And... Um, yeah, I mean, Vitality just absolutely annihilated them in the draft phase. Whether or not Vitality was thinking about anything that was going on, I actually don't think that's the case because, again, they open R1, R2, Gragas, Zaya. This is punishable with the opening that Fnatic went for, but then Fnatic blunders B2, B3, effectively rewarding the R1, R2 of Vitality. And we already talked about some of the ways that Fnatic can get a lead on, I don't know what that was. Uh, I don't know what that was. Uh, we already talked about the ways that Fnatic can get a lead on B2B3 inside of the draft and then retain some flex options while also responding to what Vitality was doing on R1, R2. But they didn't do any of that. So that is pretty much it. Uh... I, I think that uh, LS has a lot of good points. I think that uh, there are themes of, of champs that you can look to counter. 
But I think it's very important to maintain the idea of how much lane phase matters and how leveraging lane phase to create advantages with Rift Herald and with Drake stats, just because of how strong Rift Herald is right now and Dragon is right now, uh, having being in a position where your lane phase is weaker for the purpose of countering the enemy theme thematically, uh, Sometimes, you know, if, if the enemy can be first on objectives and they can, you know, maintain side wave control, it's exactly as I mentioned before. It's like the nature of all compositions change when you are forcing the enemy to face check into you. Of course, there's counterplay with uh, with spells and so forth. Like who really practices Nasus scale? We practiced a lot of Ivan top last year at Worlds. It's like Wunder played a shit ton of Ivan games uh, top. Um, Nasus, like we've seen Nasus, like it's not like Nasus uh, is uh, that important. Uh, like the Nasus is not so hard to play, but Camille is fantastic here too. Like I don't think we need to. Like Camille is really strong. It's like this is a very well, very like turbo Camille. Then retain some. Uh, is that three? Like, this is a turbo Camille game. The turbo turbo Camille game. Okay, interesting video. Really really cool video, guys. Um, if you want to check it out, leave leave a like for the video. I like this video. I think, um, yeah, it's a good video.